Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, Network for Ocean Worlds quarterly lecture series. Um, our, we're in season four here and it's called Making Measurements on Ocean Worlds. And this time we have a, a great uh, episode on looking at icy surfaces with radar with uh, once again, two really excellent speakers. One, Dr. Alex Gardner focusing on uh, earth and applications of radar on earth. And the other, Dr. Alice Abel, uh, looking from the planetary perspective. Uh, so we start with Ada, Alex Gardner, uh, who's from uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Caltech. He will discuss the major limitations in our ability to model glacier change and how radar technologies can be used to make progress in these areas. Um, so Alex is a research scientist that studies the Earth's cryosphere uh, with a particular focus on glaciers and ice sheets and their impacts on sea level rise and water resources. Uh, he has been a member of NASA's ISAT-2, NISA, GRACE, Surface Topography and Vegetation, Surface Deformation and Change, and Sister Sea Level Change Science Teams. Um, so he's also involved in many uh, novel initiatives to measure ice on Earth and elsewhere including the use of uh, snake-like robots, uh, EELS, uh, to look for life under Enceladus icy shell, and the deployable Arctic sheet exploration rovers, Dacer, to provide the mobile network and of in-situ radar sensors of subsurface mapping. So I think, Alex, um, it's up to you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I, I wasn't quite sure of uh, everybody's background. So I'm, I'm really going to start from, from a very, very high level and kind of work down into where radar technologies can help answer some of the questions we have. Um, I consider myself very sensor agnostic. Um, if it's a sensor and it can get the job done, um, I'm quite happy to use it. So I'm not a radar specialist by any means, but I do work with a lot of radars. Um, I'm the project scientist for a radar concept that we have going right now uh, because there's such valuable tools uh, for working with the ice sheets. Um, today, I'm going to focus on um, sounding radars or radars that can see through the ice. Okay, here we go. Okay. Well, let's see here. I don't, I have access to my slide. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, the planet's warming. Uh, it's going to continue to warm. Um, I think when we look at all the different scenarios, uh, it looks like we're tracking one of the more aggressive scenarios right now, this um, SSP5-8.5. Uh, um, that's kind of on the higher end of, of emissions, but um, we've been tracking that. And the Earth has been responding uh, accordingly. So, uh, you know, small changes uh, in the temperature of the Earth result in large changes in its ice cover. We live on a planet that's right on the transition between frozen and thawed. Um, and so a lot of the energy difference gets uh, absorbed into um, the creation of ice. And so when it was uh, five degrees colder, we had the Laurentide ice sheet. It came down, it covered um, nearly all of Canada uh, and crept down uh, into Boston, Chicago. Uh, there was a mile of ice over um, Chicago at one point. Uh, and it created a lot of the features that we see today. And then you turn up the thermostat by five degrees and all of the ice retreats up into the far north. And so. Uh, we live on a planet that is just highly sensitive to um, seemingly small changes in temperature. Um, and that's what we're seeing now. So as the temperatures are rising, uh, that energy is getting absorbed into the oceans and it's getting absorbed into the atmosphere. That's causing two things to happen. Um, one, you get uh, melting at the surface, uh, and then you also get um, melting uh, below the surface by the ocean. And actually the ocean, the ocean by the melting by the ocean um, is really the largest uncertainty in sea level rise. It's not necessarily the melting from um, the surface. Um, and I'll talk about that a bit next here. Okay, so where is sea level rise coming from? Um, well, uh, warm water is less dense than cold water. And so you get thermal expansion of the oceans that counts for roughly a third uh, of present day sea level rise. Um, you get a little bit of contribution from land water. So uh, there's a lot of pumping of groundwater. That groundwater eventually finds its way into the ocean and causes the ocean to rise slightly. Um, but the, the, by far the largest contributors to sea level rise are um, changes in the Antarctic grounded ice, the Greenland grounded ice and glaciers around the world. So glaciers are, you know, Alaska, Patagonia, high mountain Asia, um, Europe, 
uh, Scandinavia, and then the high Arctic islands. Those are really the places that have a lot of that ice. Um, and they are responding accordingly. So I want you to take a look at this figure and just look at the, the contributions of each. So thermal expansion is a third, uh, land water storage is quite small. Antarctic is, um, uh, sorry, a Antarctic here is a small contribution. Uh, sorry, not a small contribution. Uh, I just don't know the percentage off the top of my head here, but um, they add up about to 60% uh, Antarctic, Greenland and glaciers. And so where's that coming from? Well, we have the surface melt. Uh, this is some absolutely stunning footage uh, taken by the New York Times, um, looking at the ice uh, melting, uh, running across the surface, and then it forms these streams. And then those streams uh, move along the surface until they find uh, a moulin. And a moulin is a system, a conduit that connects the surface to the bed. And so it will go uh, nearly a kilometer through the ice down to the bed. And then that water reaches the bed. And when the water reaches the bed, it can actually modify the flow of the glacier because it changes the uh, pressure at the base of the glacier, which modifies uh, the rate at which it slides. Um, now, this next video is a little bit longer, but uh, I think it's worth um, worth the time. It's it's absolutely gorgeous footage that shows the scale. And so, what we see here is just a, a tent in the foreground. Um, there's some researchers here. They're studying some calving processes. Uh, I believe this is the Jakobshavn Glacier in Greenland. Um, there's a, a little bit of debris that falls. Uh, someone gets out of their tent. Uh, they go set up a camera at five in the morning because they, they heard some commotion, but it's a little bit too cold. They go back in the tent. And then if you watch kind of the, the area where you're starting to see things move, all of a sudden you get a giant rotation of a large iceberg. That was about a, a kilometer across and about half a kilometer deep. Um, so that's about a, a, a about a, half a cubic kilometer of ice that just calved off there. Now, when that calved off, it rotated. And when it rotated, uh, it actually hit the bedrock underneath. And that bedrock caused um, a, a seismic signal, signal that was picked up in South Dakota, right? So these are, these are processes that happen at incredibly large scales. And both runoff and glacier calving have um, been ongoing since the dawn of time. But what happens when you start modifying the climate is the rate of these processes change. And so um, what you see is the ice sheets are becoming out of balance. So the rate of, of calving, that ice breaking off, and the rate of um, ice melting and flowing into the ocean has increased, causing sea level rise. Now, here's the other um, piece of the sea level pie. And this is just looking at where does the uncertainty in future projections come from? So we, we know that sea level is changing now, but what we really want to know is where is it going to be in 100 years, 200 years? Because you know, policymakers need to make decisions about where to place infrastructure, what infrastructure to abandon, um, which uh, infrastructure to fortify. And so one of our goals at um, NASA is to try and reduce the uncertainty. And so now if we look at the um, sea level pie again, but now we're looking at the amount of uncertainty, you can see that nearly um, or over half of the uncertainty uh, comes from uh, projecting what the future contribution from the Antarctic ice sheet will be. And that's really what I'm going to talk about here, um, is why we have such large uncertainty in the Antarctic, but um, glaciers have a smaller uncertainty, Greenland has a smaller uncertainty, thermal expansion has a smaller uncertainty. uncertainty. And, um, okay, so what, what are the major sources of uncertainty here? Uh, the major sources of uncertainty are really in the process understanding. And so this is our ability to model out um, the future changes in the ice sheet. So uh, a few of the really big ones are basal sliding. So where the ice sheet makes contact with the bedrock, there's very complicated processes that occur that dictate the rate of flow and also the change in the rate of flow of the ice into the ocean. And you could imagine that if we can't, con if we can't model uh, the, the basal friction, the friction um, of the ice sheet, then it's difficult to model its future response. Um, calving and rifting, those are also very stochastic and difficult processes to model. Um, ice shelf thinning, so in the Antarctic, uh, a large amount of the ice, almost all of the ice that pours out of the ice sheet um, starts to float and forms these huge uh, state size um, floating ice shelves. And if you thin those ice shelves, you can cause the, a reduction in buttressing um, of the ice, up the upstream ice, uh, and that can cause uh, acceleration and ice flow. And then probably one of the most important is bedrock topography. And um, it may not be that intuitive, but 
Um, if you don't know the shape of the bedrock below the ice, it's incredibly hard to model uh, the future response of the ice um, to changes in forcing. And it's, it's almost akin to trying to measure orographic precipitation without mountains or um, stream flow without topography. It's, it's kind of an order one um, observable that we need to be able to model these things out to the future. And then there's some um, other sources of uncertainty. Uh, we have uh, ice atmosphere and ice ocean energy and mass exchange. So, uh, you know, precipitation matters for modeling these systems. Ice shelf melt by ocean. You know, it's a process you need to understand. Ice uh, surface melt, um, snow, fern, ice microphysics. Uh, the microphysics dictates kind of how the surface evolves and how the energy balance evolves. Um, and then internal freezing and densification. Just because you have melt on uh, an ice sheet does not mean that that melt water leaves the, uh, the ice um, and enters the ocean. And we live in exciting times, uh, I would say, unfortunately. And that is, is that both of the ice sheets uh, are very near tipping points. Um, in Greenland, once the geometry of the ice changes, um, uh, enough that it modifies uh, the surface temperature because of the lapse rate, um, it enters a period of irreversible retreat and it will decline over uh, you know, a million years or so. Uh, and in the Antarctic, we have a different process. Um, it's cold enough in the Antarctic that surface melt is not really our big concern there. Uh, the big concern in the Antarctic is um, the interaction of the ice with the ocean. And we get, um, some very interesting behavior when we start to change the force balance of some of the glaciers in the Antarctic. Um, and we call this uh, interesting behavior that has a feedback called uh, the marine ice sheet instability. And there's a situation where uh, if a glacier sits on a retrograde bed and you start to thin the front, um, it, it enters a feedback loop if that um, front thins enough where um, the retreat will beget more retreat, will beget more rapid thinning, will beget uh, more retreat. Uh, and these processes have been studied uh, very heavily in our community. You know, it's a focus of a lot of the stuff that we do. And that marine ice, cliff, ice sheet instability is really where a lot of the uncertainty and sea level rise projections come from. Um, and looking uh, at these processes in detail, it looks like we're really sitting close um, to the precipice of entering the tipping points for both of those processes. Um, it's in the range of about 1.5 to two uh, degrees of warming, um, slightly above that threshold is where we think that those, um, those feedbacks will be ignited. So this is all to say that it's really the subsurface processes um, that play a large role in controlling the rates uh, of change for the Antarctic ice sheet. So we have the ice shelf, uh, you know, depicted here, uh, in the floating section, uh, you know, monitoring how thick that ice is um, tells us how much um, resistive force it can supply uh, on the upstream ice. Um, we are very interested in the conditions uh, right near the bed. So where the ice meets the bedrock, you know, you have subglacial water there. Uh, we're interested in the pressures. We're interested in whether it's frozen or dry. Um, we're also interested in the shape of the bedrock, which controls uh, es essentially the response of the ice sheet to um, some forcing. Uh, we're interested in the calving processes. We're interested in the melting that occurs below the ice. So a lot of these processes happen uh, below the ice. And um, we've known for quite a while that, that longer frequency radar uh, is able to see through the ice uh, and provide reflections where there's changes in the dielectric properties where we have dielectric contrast. And so um, we're able to, uh, you know, fly radar. Um, we've only done this from airborne platforms on Earth so far. I know uh, for planetary, we've had some sounders, uh, some orbital sounders, uh, but for Earth, we have not had an orbital sounder yet. And so we um, have great data from airplanes. Uh, one of NASA's flagship uh, was flown on uh, sorry, it's flown as part of Operation Icebridge. Um, this is a, I think it's about 200 megahertz, just under 200 megahertz radar. And uh, it gives beautiful history or, or details of the ice. And so you can see here, uh, it shows you where the surface is. It provides um, um, internal layering. Um, so you can see where there's a, a dielectric contrast within the ice. This might be a volcanic deposition. Um, and then uh, on this figure, you can actually see some folding 
just like you would see in tectonics. And then at the bottom, you see a nice reflection from the bed and you can um, map the bedrock shape uh, following uh, the bedrock return, but you can also look at the magnitude of the return from um, bedrock and also infer properties about its specularity or um, whether it's wet or dry, the dielectric contrast. So one of the missions that I'm, I'm intimately involved with is a mission concept called OASIS. And um, this is really to try and map the bedrock below the Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and this is to constrain the ice sheet models. And so this is just one example uh, of a mission. Um, this is, uh, it would have one mother sat, it would be uh, transmit and receive, it would have a 12 meter antenna, uh, and then it would have four daughter sats. And so the mother sat, is actually um, copied off of the Reason instrument. It has a little bit different uh, digital backend, um, but it's the same antenna and using a lot of the same subsystems as um, the Reason instrument that's on the Europa Clipper. Uh, and then uh, four data sets, which are receive only uh, and uh, much smaller. Uh, this allows for a cross-track focusing and decreases the, the footprint size on the ground. And here's just an example of how that system works. It's, it's you know, it's pretty cool um, how you can form that cross-track array. And so on the left-hand side, you're just seeing the, the constellation, you know, orbiting the Earth. Um, and then on the right-hand side, that's a top-down view. And this is how you get that um, circular array is the, the daughter sats are actually flying at slightly different altitudes then the mother sat and that creates this um, circular rotation around oasis and so around the mother uh sorry around the mothership and when they're in the across track orientation you get the across track focusing okay so our current coverage after flying for about 57 years we've had aircraft flying we've invested uh, i think there's been about 150 airborne missions to the Antarctic to measure the bedrock thickness over the last 57 years. And that's the figure on the bottom right. And in the top right is what we think we can do from uh, an orbital platform. And so within 18 months of flying this mission, you can uh, more than double um, the amount of bedrock observations that we've had in the last 57 years. And in addition, you're creating uh, like a homogeneous data set that, that will be easier to explore. Um, for other signals than just bedrock. Um, and I've also worked with uh, some, some robots for monitoring ice ocean interaction. And so um, this is a concept that's very dear to me. Um, we're not cur uh, currently working on it, but um, we hope to revive it again. And this is this um, Dasher. So it's a mobile network of in-situ radar sensors for subsurface mapping. and. The idea here was to develop a really low cost um, uh, robot uh, with a software defined radar uh, with off the shelf parts that we could build for under $15,000 a piece. And the idea is, is that you can drop these out of plane and have them self assemble and start taking observations in um, hard, to re hard to access places in the Antarctic. And um, this concept was really driven by the need to measure um, basal melt rates. So this is the melt rates that occur underneath the ice shelves. So when the ice melts, it creates a fresh, warm, buoyant plume of water. And then that etches a channel into the underside of the ice shelf. Um, and so it's really an inverted river network. And you remember I was saying these ice shelves are, are huge. They're the size of states. And so you have you know rivers kind of up the size of Mississippi that are flowing underneath the ice shelves. And the rate at which they melt the ice shelves dictates kind of the ability for the ice shelf to provide back stress to the, to the inland ice. And so the concept here, here's actually, sorry, here's, here's an example of, so all the bright areas on the right-hand side, basically all of those are ice shelves, those glass flowing areas. And on the left-hand side, um, those arrows are just pointing um, uh, sub ice shelf river networks. And the way you can see it here is really just by looking at a hill shade of an elevation model. So they have a surface expression as well. And these um, channels are found kind of all over the Antarctic. Um, 
And so the idea is, is that you can um, deploy these robots and uh, measure the ice shelf evolution at the location of these uh, river networks. Uh, and you would uh, drive the robots back and forth kind of on a daily to weekly time scale so that you could get a, a time series of the of the melt evolution and then be able to link that to properties like changes in ocean properties and tidal pumping. And here's an example of, of the robot. Um, it just had uh, fat tires and then uh, uh, software defined radar in the middle and then a large bow tie antenna um, that was um, strapped to the bottom. And this was around, I think 230 megahertz. And so we can see uh, through kilometers of dry ice. Uh, and here's an example of the robot uh, being tested in the Mojave Desert. I'll just play this, Let's see here. And each wheel is able to move independently um, so that it could get itself uh, unstuck if it needed to. And so the bow tie antenna would just strap to the bottom of this and um, has a low cost software defined antenna. Um, So it's a simple design on purpose uh, to make it robust and cheap. Okay. And we were able to work out the timing such that you can operate these as a herd of robots uh, and actually do synthetic aperture radar um, or an, an INSAR uh, on the, the base of the glacier. And so you can see uh, with very high resolution what the change in geometry at the base is with the change in melt over time. Okay, and then this is just to wrap it up. Um, so ice sheets are predictable. Um, you know, the, it's, it's a fairly well-behaved flow. Unfortunately, the boundary conditions are, are very challenging. Um, so ice sheets are predictable, but progress uh, in understanding uh, needs to accelerate uh, faster than the ice sheets are accelerating themselves. And this is just um, kind of a flashback uh, to the 19, 1978, where uh, there was a paper in Nature that said that if we double the CO2 concentration uh, in the atmosphere, we uh, have the potential for rapid collapse of the West Antarctic ice shelf. Um, and these predictions are getting closer to becoming true. Uh, I think that our understanding is, is more sophisticated and nuanced than it was in 1978, uh, but there's still considerable progress that needs to be made. And a lot of that progress is dependent on fairly basic observations that we lack, uh, one of them being uh, um, bedrock elevation uh, for underneath the ice sheets. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, I have uh, some questions here. Um, yeah, that was a great talk. Let me pull this up. Okay, um, the first question uh, is, do the sounding radars transmit linear or circular polarized radiation? And uh, do any receive both polarizations? If you have any sort of good references on this, please do mention them. Uh, yeah, so um, the sounding radars, it, it depends on the system you're designing. Um, o Oasis, the, uh, the um, constellation uh, does uh, multipolarization uh, and that's required to uh, overcome some of the ionospheric effects. Um, I'm not sure if they're doing multipolarize. Yeah, they do multipolarization for the airborne um, campaigns as well. Uh, we're flying an airborne campaign in Greenland this March, but we're actually op opting not to do uh, multiple polarization uh, just because of the, the data rate, but um, it has the capability to do polarization as well, VB, uh, VH. Great, okay, um, another question is, is there any systematic reason other than budgets why no earth observing satellites have flown ice penetrating radar to date? And do you think that can change faster than the Europa Clipper gets to Jupiter in the 2030s? Yeah, I mean, that's our first argument is we've flown these on almost every other planet. We're, we're now on moons of other planets and we still don't have one. Um, I, I guess uh, we have aircraft here. Uh, and so uh, some of this could be justified by flying aircraft, but I think people don't really understand the scale 
you know, um, the Antarctic is one and a half times the size of the United States, and we've been flying it for about 57 years, and we're still not anywhere near a complete map of the bedrock. Uh, so the only solution is uh, uh, an orbital sounder, but it's it's very difficult to convince people of that just with the other priorities. Um, but hopefully, hopefully faster than it takes for Europa Clipper to get get there. So, so I guess a sort of a follow up on that then is what type of resolution is required for the bedrock mapping to reduce the large uncertainty around the Antarctic ice loss? Yeah, so so anything is better than nothing. Um, it kind of the benefit becomes a little asymptotic around two kilometers uh, resolution. Um, the ice is able to kind of absorb uh, features uh, that are smaller than that. Um, all right, and then let's see, I guess one last question. Um, is the uncertainty low for sort of the glacier component to a sea level rise because it's just well established that they will disappear or is there, why do we understand those so much better? Um, we don't have the big, uh, the big tipping points um, for the glaciers. so. You know, they're, they're sitting in uh, a, a very hot room melting away, uh, but there's not a lot of really exciting dynamics going on with the mountain glaciers. They also have a finite volume. Uh, they can only contribute so much uh, to sea level rise before they're all gone. Um, when you look at the globe, really all of the mass that can contribute to sea level rise is all located up in the high Arctic on the high Arctic islands. Um, you know, uh, the Alps is, is it, it could disappear tomorrow and sea level wouldn't change. Um, Alaska is a bit of a different story. It's got, it's got more ice, but um, so it, it comes down to the fact that they just don't have these big, big feedbacks. It's really an atmosphere melt process. There's, uh, it's limited how much you can get out at a time. And then it's also limited how much you can get out in total. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thanks again for a, a great talk. Um, Audrey, we'll, we'll hand it back to you to introduce our, our planetary speaker. Thanks. So we move to Alice Legal, uh, who's from LATMOS at the University of Versailles Saint Quentin. Uh, she would present her work on the observation of Saturn's icy moons in the microwave domain. Uh, and she will especially focus on Enceladus, uh, showing how the joint analysis of passive and active radar data can reveal thermal anomalies and peculiar subsurface properties. Uh, so Alice is an expert in radar and radiometry, remote sensing of planetary sub surfaces and subsurfaces, and she's an associate member of the Cassini radar team and COI on Dragonfly. So Alice, it's your turn. Thanks a lot. Oh, so I share my screen. Okay. Do you see it in full screen? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about icy surfaces, but further away from, from the sun. I won't talk really about sounding radar because actually uh, no um, sounding radar uh, have ever um, probed the subsurface of uh, icy moons, whether it's a Jovian and, uh, or um, Saturnian icy moons. But as you know, it's about to change uh, because uh, both uh, the Juice and the Europa Clipper are have, um, have an ice penetrating radar on board. But before that, it's mainly, well, it's um, imagine radar, but you can see that even if they are um, designed uh, not really to sound the subsurface, uh, because water ice is a very transparent medium to microwave, well, they do um, bring information also uh, uh, on the subsurface, not only on the surface. So I just start uh, saying that um, radar data actually come in two flavors, uh, in an active and passive mode. So at a given wavelength in the microwave domain, so typically uh, a few centimeters, in the active mode, uh, an imaging radar uh, well, will uh, measure uh, how reflective the surface is and the surface is in the backscattering direction with respect to an isotropic surface. So basically it measures uh, either albedo, a radar albedo, or a radar cross-section. And this uh, measurement really uh, gives, uh, well, is uh, related to the composition and the structure of the surface and the subsurface, which means related, uh, when I say structure, I mean porosity, roughness, drain size, heterogeneities, and so on. 
in the passive mode, a radar will record the thermal emission from the surface and subsurface. So more specifically, it measures a uh, brightness temperature that is uh, the product of the uh, surface emissivity and effective physical temperature. So uh, this measurement also provides insight into the composition and structure of the surface and subsurface, but also on its temperature, effective physical temperature. So an important point, but I think Alex uh, told you, uh, told, uh, you uh, that uh, uh, before, is that water ice, especially water ice at very low temperature, at the low temperature of the Jovian or Saturnian moons, is a very transparent me medium at microwaves compared to silicate, for instance. So uh, what we call the electrical skin death, which is basically a proxy for the sounding death of the radar, can be uh, hundreds of times the wavelengths. So for instance, at two centimeters, uh, well, uh, in an ultra clean water ice regolith, you can expect a sounding depth of almost 100 meter, which is huge, it's really huge. So again, even if your plane is to look at the surface, you will have signal from the subsurface. And this high transparency, uh, transparency allows the waves to uh, uh, travel long distance in the subsurface. And this um, gives them um, many opportunities uh, to be scattered by embedded heterogeneities. So the purer is the water rise, the longer the wave will travel in the subsurface, and uh, the more opportunities uh, they will have to uh, be scattered, which will result in a enhanced reflectivity and a reduced emissivity. Of course, if you add impurities to the water ice, then the sounding depth will decrease and the reflectivity will decrease, the emissivity will increase. So in other words, uh, microwave observation, whether they are passive or active, are tightly related to um, the degree of purity of the of water ice regolith and also the degree of maturity, the, the nature of the scatterers that are embedded in the subsurface. And of course, if we learn about this um, uh, properties of the regolith, we also uh, have information about the geological processes that have uh, shaped the, the regolith. So let's uh, look at um, so my favorite uh, target for radar. So these are um, some moons of Saturn, the ma main moons of Saturn. So after Titan, the six larger, uh, largest moons are Mimas, Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, Rhea, and Iapetus. I also show here Phoebe, which is very different. Um, it's an irregular moon, it's darker, it's smaller, obviously. But um, overall, all these moons are uh, mainly composed of uh, water ice. Uh, however, their surface, they exhibit very different um, uh, regolith, surface regolith, uh, due to, oh, sorry, due to uh, different geological history and different near uh, env environment. Um, two, well, uh, they also show some different, um, different degree of, um, of uh, geological activity with, of course, Enceladine being uh, currently uh, active with uh, Geyser um, on, the, on the South Pole. And uh, so Enceladus and Titan are actually regarded as ocean world, and there are also some uh, evidence uh, for a buried uh, ocean on, on Dione. So the, the, the history of this uh, moon is partially recorded in their subsurface, and again, uh, microwave observation in active and passive mode can help um, access this, uh, this uh, history. So for this talk, uh, well, I should say that there, there is actually there a wealth of data on Titan, but this is really out of, of the scope of this talk because it would take hours and it's a whole different world. So I would really focus on airless Saturnian satellites. For this object, uh, microwave observation are quite rare and recent. So there was some Arecibo observation from, so from the Arecibo radar system at a wavelength of 13 centimeters. Um, some uh, ground-based radio telescope also observation, especially of Iapetus, but most of uh, the microwave data we have on this object are coming from the Cassini mission. On the Cassini probe, there was a, a radar um, that could operate at a wavelength of 2.2 centimeters, both in the active and passive mode. Unfortunately, because this radar was designed to observe actually the surface of Titan through the veil of uh, its atmosphere, uh, it was only turned um, occasionally to uh, airless moons, and most of the observations we have are distant observations. So they provide only uh, disk-integrated quantities, 
So in active mode, they provide disk integrity uh, radar albedo, and in passive mode, they provide disk integrity brightness temperature that can be converted in any CVTs. Anyway, let's look at the, um, the active uh, Cassini radar observation. Uh, so these uh, plots that show the radar albedo of, of the main, uh, the major Saturnian moon uh, um, is the result of the analysis and reduction of um, tens of uh, observation. You see that it shows significant variation uh, among uh, the Saturnian satellites with Titan being the radar darkest uh, object and Enceladus the radar brightest with the radar albedo as I as three, which is really, really huge. I will come back on that. And so uh, our, the interpretation is that uh, this variation primarily reflects variation in terms of degree of uh, contamination or degree of purity of their regolith. Uh, so Titan being dirty and Celadius being clean, if, you, if, you, um, if I should say it like that. And a further argument for that is really the very strong correlation we are observed between the optical and radar albedo. So this very strong correlation further implies that uh, the optically, uh, well, the contaminants of the regolith are both optically dark and microwave absorbent, and that these contaminants are present also at depth, not only at the very surface. And this is also true at a no local scale. For instance, here we, we had um, the opportunity to have uh, some result of observation of rare. And as you can see, um, there is a very bright feature here, which is associated with the ictomy crater. And it's not surprising to, um, to say that uh, we can expect to have a fresh and clean water rise exposed at the surface of this fresh uh, crater. It, uh, it's fr uh, water rise that have been excavated from, from deeper. So basically, um, uh, far from, uh, from Saturn, um, the, um, the, the surface of, uh, of Iapetus, and in, in particular the surface of the leading side of Iapetus, is progressively coated by uh, dark dust from the Phoebe's uh, debris, uh, debris rings. And, and this actually, um, this we, I don't show it here, but we really see very well the dichotomy between the leading and the trailing side of Iapetus uh, at two centimeters, uh, which means that the layer, the thickness of the dark uh, deposition layer on the leading side is at least a few centimeters. On the other hand, uh, with the Arecibo radar system, we don't see any longitudinal pattern. So this means that um, this dark layer on the Apetus sliding side must be at most a few meters. Titan is also dark, as I said, and it's very easy to uh, explain. It's because its surface is covered by some optically dark and microwave absorbent uh, organic compounds that are um, produced by photochemistry in, uh, in its atmosphere. Closer to Saturn, uh, well, uh, we think that uh, the main explanation for the very high uh, radar brightness of the uh, Saturn uh, inner moon is, is uh, the deposition of ultra clean uh, water ice particles from the earring. So the earring is this ring that is alimented by Enceladus gazer. And this earring guarantees the deposition of very clean water ice on all these moons, uh, especially the ones that are uh, close to Enceladus. In the case of Enceladus also, it's really uh, possible that, um, well, the fact that it's geologically very young make it uh, cleaner because geological activity is also a way to bring fresh uh, water ice at the surface. So this is only a sketch uh, trying to summarize uh, what we learn about the subsurface um, uh, regolith, uh, and especially the purity, uh, the, the purity of the waterized regolith of all airless uh, Saturn moons. Uh, and as you can, uh, as you understood, um, learning about uh, this uh, purity of uh, regolith uh, tells us things about, um, uh, well, um, the interaction of the moons with the uh, dust ring uh, of Saturn, um, their geological activity, or even uh, impact, uh, impact cratering. So another important outcome from this observation is that I told you already, but these high inner moon are really, really, really bright at two centimeters, really bright, even brighter than the Galilean moon at similar uh, wavelengths. 
Um, they also exhibit some peculiar properties. For instance, their bar scatter is weakly dependent on the incident angle, which is kind of hard to explain. They also, uh, uh, the Galilean moon also have some strange uh, circular polarization ratio uh, anyway. Um, but keep in mind that uh, these objects uh, are really among the most radar bright objects in the solar system. And this cannot be explained by the composition alone. This means that their subsurface contains some scattering um, um, structure that act, that are very efficient at returning uh, the waves in the bar scattering direction. So it's been a while people are trying to explain these peculiar uh, radar properties. Um, until recently, models that were only assuming randomly distributed uh, scatterer in the subsurface were not able uh, really to explain this high uh, radar um, albedo. Even assuming, um, even um, taking into account the Korean backscattering effect, which is a, uh, which results from the constructive um, interference between uh, between the direct and reverse part in the backscattering direction after a multiplicity of scattering events. That's why some authors also well pro uh, propose that some exotic structure could be present at the surface of these moons, um, such as. Uh, Penitents, ice balls, uh, ice pipes, or buried crater. So structure that could uh, enhance the signal in the backscattering direction. But most of them are not, are not really um, plausible from a geologic point of view. So, uh, and so until recently we were there, but last, last year, and I see Jason is online, uh, Jason uh, of Gardner and Anne published this paper uh, where they found that um, just a small adaptation of uh, apical basketball model was uh, sufficient to explain uh, both the circular polarization ratio and um, let's say the radar albedo at, um, at uh, 13 centimeters of uh, the Jovian and Saturnian moon. So in this model, um, well, the scatter have no specific shape uh, they have to be uh, uh, with the size of the other the wavelengths and uh, and separated by by some yeah by by distance that is the, uh, of the order of the wavelengths, but it's not uh, very constraining. So this is good, but how, however, um, well, uh, we find that this model unfortunately cannot explain uh, both active and passive data we have uh, we have, we measured at two point two centimeters. So. I told you already about active data. I will now tell you about passive data. So these are the active data you saw already, and these are the uh, brightness, disintegrated brightness temperature we measured over the same, the same object. Um, maybe you can see at first glance that we have a strong, we have some uh, an anti-correlation between, uh, of course, between these two quantities, which is of course expected. And um, to show it better. What we did uh, it's to we use the combined thermal and radiative transfer model to convert our brightness temperature in emissivities. So now I'm going to show you uh, yes the scatter plot. So um, this is showing uh, the uh, radar albedo I showed you before as a function of uh, the emissivities, and you can see now that the, there is definitely a strong anti-correlation between these two uh, quantities, which is again expected. But what is more interesting is that you can see that, um, well, we well the, there is a linear, continuous linear trend uh, from Titan here that is the most uh, radar dark and uh, most emissive um, object and Enceladus, which is the radar brightest and uh, le least emissive uh, uh, moon of, of Saturn. And, and, and so, so this means that our first interpretation, again, uh, that basically what uh, controls the most, um, well, basically one moon is on a, a, a given point on this linear trend, depending really on the degree of volume scattering in this subsurface, and the degree of volume scattering again is really related to the to the regolith, uh, the degree of transparency uh, of uh, of the regolith. And by the way, here you can see uh, the same um, data for uh, the Galilean moon. Actually, these are measurements made at 3.5 centimeters, but it's quite similar. And again, you can see that um, uh, what I've told you before, the Galilean moon are bright, but not as bright as, um, as, uh, as the uh, Saturnian moon. Uh, 
So now when we try to compare these uh, data points uh, and the, especially this slope here with um, outcome from the models, uh, well, this is what we obtained. So in red, this is the APCA model, well, the one uh, of Garner and, and uh, used uh, pushed to its maximum. It's really pushed to its maximum. Um, and uh, here we we are well, not under, as you can see, it's really uh, we are far away from from the the observed slope. We also tried uh, to see what we obtain with another model. It's a semi-empirical model, uh, but and we pushed it also to the extreme case. And again, as you see, um, the slope. Uh, the, the observed linear relationship exhibits a slope that is a factor of two larger. That's the most extreme um, uh, case we obtain with purely a random scattering model. So at this stage, the mechanism that is responsible for air, the air and strata brightness of Saturn in our moon is really not uh, data, is yet to be determined. Oh, uh, yeah. So I put this because. We see on the surface of uh, Enceladus many structures, uh, like we call them boulders. Maybe, maybe they exist also at a smaller scale. Maybe they play a part in this radar brightness, but this is really uh, very speculative, speculative at this stage. This uh, scatter plot also contains um, some information about um, uh, on the temperature of the object. If you maybe you have noted that Enceladus, the data points that are associated with Enceladus and Dione are a little bit are somewhat off the general trend. And this could be due to the fact that we have overestimated their emissivities uh, because we have underestimated their uh, if, uh, physical temperature. To estimate the physical temperature, we assume no endogenic heat flux. But if there is an, an endogenic heat flux, then it means that um, this value, are the, their physical temperature is higher and the emissivity is smaller. And then Enceladus and Dione could you know, go in the, in the general trend. So we think that maybe this is an indication of an uh, endogenic heat source on uh, this object. Uh, well, we know. Uh, there is an if look on Enceladus, but this would mean that it's not only um, focused on the on the source polar terrain, but also uh, outside from this uh, this terrain. And okay, so I still have time. Um, so there was actually already um, uh, a result obtained by a joint analysis of uh, active and passive observation of Enceladus. So it was a, a reserve observation. Uh, and only a very small, this is what I'm showing here, a very small area of Enceladus near the Tiger Strip was observed. And comparing this active and passive observation to um, a thermal model, combined to a radiative thermal model, where we, they, we, we were able to estimate a minimum heat flux in excess in this region. So it was um, new because in this region, um, the no uh, thermal anomalies were, was detected, uh, especially by, by the CIRS instrument on board Cassini. And um, while well, uh, estimating this uh, minimum heat flux, we could also um, estimate that uh, the buried, um, well, that the buried ocean uh, of Enceladus could be only a few kilometers uh, below the surface. Uh, below, so it, this is very close to the surface. This is typically uh, a feature that uh, notion that could be detected by by a, a sounding radar in the future. The um, the Cassini active and passive observation also revealed um, well uh, an anomaly uh, emissive, actually it's the emissivity anomaly on the leading side of Enceladus, and uh, so the leading side of Enceladus is really less emissive, thirty percent less emissive than the trailing side. And this dichotomy is also uh, observed at 13 centimeter wavelengths by Arecibo. You see already um, uh, that the leading side is rather bright. So this means that in this area, we expect to, well, we can expect to have a locally cleaner water ice. And this area actually correlates especially very well with um, a, a terrain called the leading hemisphere terrain that is uh, uh, seemingly uh, geologically young. And using both the Cassini data at 2 centimeters, the Arecibo at 13 centimeters, um, well, um, Rees and Jensen estimated that this, uh, this terrain could be actually uh, as young as uh, 200 million years. So you see with this, uh, so it could be actually a, a, an ancient active region 
uh, today only the South Polar Terrain is active, but maybe uh, a few uh, hundreds of millions of years ago, this uh, leading hemisphere was also active. So to summarize, um, radar observation, as, uh, as I try to say, um, provide really, uh, can provide really insight into the chemical, uh, structural, and thermal property of icy surface. Especially understanding the structure is especially important when it comes to uh, the preparation of future missions that uh, plan to land on this surface. At first order, what we measure with, uh, with this observation is really uh, um, the degree of purity of the regolith. But this degree of purity is tightly related to the interaction with dust ring, which is very specific to the Saturnian system, but it's, it's really important. It's also related to uh, recent volcanic activity or tectonic activity or impact. So it tells us something about the endogenic and exogenic processes that are, that are at play. When uh, looking both at uh, active and passive data, we can also reveal thermal anomalies, which of course is very important to assess the habitability of a, a moon. And, um, and, and uh, in the case of Enceladus, uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's very interesting because we, 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 we can be confident that with a, a future ice uh, penetrating radar, we will be able uh, to detect uh, the buried ocean, um, at least at the South Pole. So far, as I said, there is no explanation uh, for the extreme radar brightness of Saturn's moon, at least at two centimeters. And what we want to find is really um, a model that can reproduce uh, the radar data, both the active and passive radar data, and of course that is geologically plausible. Um, to finish, I uh, just want to um, stress uh, the value of really of using a multi-wavelength of observation. You see how valuable it was to have also a receivable, a receivable measurement, even, even if it's not resolved, it's really valuable because of course different wavelengths will probe different depth. So, Oh yeah, I forgot to say that. Um, yeah, I will come back. Uh, so for instance, um, so it's only passive measurement, but the microwave uh, radiometer on board Juno uh, has this ability of, uh, uh, here it's Ganymede, so looking at uh, the brightness temperature of Ganymede at wavelengths uh, from uh, one centimeter to 50 centimeters. And uh, for instance, uh, with this data set, they were able to derive a, a thermal gradient in, the, in a vertical thermal gradient. It's very, very useful. Um, there is also a paper that is out actually today, so I have to mention it, uh, by, by Lea Bonfoy, and it's a paper with, she was my PhD student, uh, that shows the first uh, microwave spectra of, Yap of Yapetus leading and trailing side, and it's very different, and we learn a lot of things from, from this kind of uh, multi-wavelength observation. Another way forward, and, it, and then I stop, it's also to, uh, to, uh, to relate to the previous talk, is also to look at uh, analogs on Earth. So it's relative analogs, of course, but we do have some radiometry and radar data over the Antarctica um, the, on, I, I, uh, I shared in particular. And, and so looking at this uh, data set, uh, comparing it with snow rad radiative transfer model in snow and so on can also uh, uh, help at least um, to, to find a, or propose a new solution for, for, the, uh, for, for the high radar, the peculiar radar properties of ice limits. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on time. Thank you. Another wonderful talk. Um, okay, we have a, a few questions already queued up, so let me bring that up. Um, okay. So the first question is, um, do salts in the ice increase or decrease the radar brightness? I, I think it would decrease it because it would decrease the tonding death, the electrical skin death. So it means that the, the wave will penetrate, will travel less distance, so there will be less uh, volume scattering. So it would, it, it would result in a smaller radar albedo. Okay, so so salts like organics, like anything, are contaminants, and they yeah. acidate. Yes, they they are l l much less transparent than water ice, which is pretty transparent. Okay, uh, and then the next one is: um, Is there any possibility of an instrumental artifact that would lead to the difference in radar brightness between the Galilean and Saturnian systems? 
the difference? Well, we don't need an artifact. So, of course, we, we looked at this uh, many times, but uh, we don't need to explain the difference between the Galilean and the, uh, and the, I don't see why. I, and I, I mean, there's reason why uh, we could expect the Saturnian moon to be uh, to be brighter, especially the inner moon. You know, this earring it's something very specific to the Saturnian system. There is no equivalent uh, on, the, on on around Jupiter, obviously, and so it's it's not that. Um, I mean, it's not that surprising. I think really what's going on is that we have longer wavelengths, so longer sounding depth uh, in the Saturnian system. So, but um, but uh, again, so I only um, uh, participate uh, to the calibration and analysis of the Cassini radar data. I did not uh, work, you know, I just took the published result on the Galilean moon, so. But, but, so I guess, but so there's, so it does that that difference then doesn't reveal something surprising in the difference between the two systems. No, I think yeah, exactly. The, the the matter is not the difference between the two systems. The matter is how high uh, are these radar albedos. They were already very high in the Jovian system, and it was already very complicated to explain them and. Uh, and I think Jason and, and uh, of Garner and and they did a great job, but but it's even higher, especially at two centimeters in the in the Saturnian system. I'm not surprised it's higher in the Saturnian system compared to the Jovian system, but I'm surprised by the absolute values. Okay, great. Well, um, I think we are just about at time. Let me just double check for. Any last questions? Um, I think, I think that's it. So, two questions uh, oh, online also. If you uh, can, if you see them, can you uh, relay them, Audrey? Uh, Jenny, uh, I don't know if you can make people speak. <laughs> Maybe I can. Maybe let's see. Quick. Oh yeah, look oh. at that. I can. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Great talk, yeah. Elise. Um, thank you. I just I was thinking that maybe Titan was missing from the passive data chart, and I oh. thought oh, because of the atmosphere. But then I remembered, no, we have brightness, temperature, and emissivity. Yeah, no, it's missing in one uh, in one um, in one slide, but it's uh, other. It's it's in the scatter plots. I don't know if I can share again. Uh, it's it's missing in the first. Um, uh, can I just up that again? No. Oh, no, but, I but the atmosphere doesn't have oh, yeah, problems. Yeah, it's here. It's it's really here. You see, it's here. No, no, we know we know very well the emissivity of uh, Titan. That's uh, because on Titan it's very easy because we don't need a thermal model. The physical temperature is constant, oh. so we have a very oh. good uh, understanding. So the emissivity is well known. I didn't put here. I, I was showing brightness temperature. I could have put uh, Titan, but it's it's really constant, and we know it very well. Thank you. And yeah, it looks like you also have your hand up. Oh, yeah, I, you know, just thinking about what could cause the, the radar brightness, um, you know, it's a super interesting problem because these on Earth glacier surfaces have all sorts of really interesting features. I understand the temperature and the fluxes and all of that will be different, but um, there's always these processes that reinforce each other uh, where you have a gradient in absorption of energy. Um, and so I was just thinking, you know, on Earth, we have these things that are just fascinating. They're called cryoconite. Um, they're a melt feature that, that basically forms these, these tubular shafts. Mm. And I was wondering if something similar could happen with um, sublimation flux um, around deposition particles, where you would end up moving the, you know, sublimating away from these features and allowing them to kind of form a, a, a physical feature on the surface. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you. So are you referring to the ice ice pipes? You know, uh, so uh, because in Greenland there is some ice pipe. Uh, you know, there is a paper from Greenland. Uh, so, so yeah, no, it's a good question, and um, I don't know if it's geologically plausible if it's sublimation can can do that. It's uh, I don't do this kind of uh, simulation. I know. Um, uh, I know there was a paper, I won't remember the name, but uh, trying to see if we could form penitent on Europa also. And I think the conclusion was no by sublimation, of course. So, but 
So yeah, I think the the penitentes require very specific sun angles, um, mm -hmm. and it needs to be near melting. Um, so I wouldn't think that that would be a plausible scenario. But I anyway, I'm very curious. I, are you are we going to receive any really high resolution imagery of the surface that might reveal what this what the smaller scale structure is where these things would matter? Well, the next mission for Enceladus is not uh, selected yet. <laughs> so maybe maybe in the 50s, if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, that's, why, <laughs> that's why we can, uh, we can play with our imagination meanwhile. Uh, no, unfortunately, um, the, the, the highest resolution image we have, I show some of them uh, uh, are um, the highest resolution, it's like four meters. And, and we see this really uh, boulder, this big boulder at the surface of Enceladus. We don't really know how they form, maybe it's like snowball or we don't know. Um, so, so we, but we do, we do see some structure there, large scale structure with respect to our wavelengths, but maybe there are other processes at play, but uh, unfortunately, um, uh, yeah, we have to stick to, uh, to try to answer this question by models or by finding possible an analogs on Earth. Thanks. Okay, well, let's uh, thank our, both our speakers again. Uh, really, really great talks. Um, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, yeah, we're, we're at the top of the hour, so I will stop recording. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing you all at the next episode.